certainly um, quite strange compared to some of the other experts we've heard speaking already on the stage today. And my previous life was racing around the world on boats. The boat you can see on the screen is a boat that I broke this solo non-stop round the world record with, which I managed to achieve in the beginning of 2005. Now that brought me into this debate specifically through the subject of resources. And just if you could imagine for a minute, if you set off to sail solo non-stop around the world, you set off for a journey of three to three and a half months, you take with you everything that you will need for your survival for that full period, and you man manage what you have down to the last drop of diesel and the last packet of food. In the Southern Ocean, you're two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town, so if you need to buy some more resources, some more stores, more food, you can't because that nearest shop is two and a half thousand miles away, and if you injure yourself, it takes five days for a ship to get to you, and then five days for that ship to get you back into Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, or South America. You literally race around Antarctica. And if ever there's a situation in your life that makes you realize the value of resources, it's being out there in that situation. But never had I made the, the translation of that incredible understanding of what finite means from the boat to our global economy until I stepped off the boat at the finish line. And suddenly, I began to see global economics in a very different way, in a way I'd never even thought of before. And for me, I suddenly realized that when you look at resources, when you look at the way the economy functions, it's ultimately predominantly linear. That means the economy is driven by taking something out of the ground, making something out of it, and ultimately, in the majority of cases, that product gets thrown away. And it's not really designed for any other system. It's designed to do the job for the time that product is being used, be it a piece of packaging or a car. And then ultimately, at the end of its life, it disappears. We lose those resources because they're not designed to be recovered. And if you put that into economic context, in a recent report that we did in conjunction with the an analyst and consultant McKinsey, if you look at the value of that just from a, a consumer goods perspective, so we look at packaging, uh, food waste, that value is 3.2 trillion globally. That's the, the value of that, uh, that part of the market but we only recover by value 20% of that, a tiny fraction. We lose 2.7 trillion US dollars globally just because we can't capture that, which seems such a shame because we're not designing that into the system. And that's looking at packaging. Imagine steel, imagine vehicles, imagine printers, photocopiers, putting them into that same context. And when I began learning about how economy functions, learning about how we use resources, I started to talk to people, CEOs, experts, scientists, this is now back in 2006, 2007. What are the solutions to this? If we have finite resources, if they're fundamental to our economy, to the operation of our businesses, what are the solutions? And so much of the narrative was about using less. It was about efficiency. It was about buying us time, which, of course, is absolutely essential in the transition. But the transition to what? And for me, seeing that we've seen a century of price declines erased in 10 years, the fact that we've got three billion new middle class consumers coming online, we're seeing these commodity prices under more and more pressure. We're seeing more volatility in the markets than we've seen before in history. And we start to look at an economic outlook in which just using a bit less, we're not, through which using a bit less is not going to provide a solution. And then I just came across people who thought differently. They saw the economy in a different way. You could call this a circular economy. I talked to people from the performance economy, from cradle to cradle, from industrial symbiosis, people who had looked at this perhaps through a different lens. And then I began to piece together the picture of an economy which is restorative by design, an economy within which, from the outset, we design so we can recover the materials, we can, discover, we can recover the components, we can recover the products themselves, and actually we can drive value through taking those products from the outer loops, which you can see in the diagram in front of you, which is recycling on the right-hand side in the blue technical side, towards the inner loops, where there's a significant amount of value through decomponentization, remanufacture, disassembly. And even if you end up in that outer loop of recycling, the product at the outset was designed for that. It's designed so you can recover those materials. Take the left-hand side of the graph. That shows this biological cycle. When we look at the global economic opportunity of the biological cycle, it's huge. Here in Europe, we take food waste, we take human waste. In many cases, that just disappears out of our system. It may get landfilled, it may get thrown away, it may end up getting washed into streams and rivers. But if you look at the value of one ton of food waste, it's huge. It's $6 of fertilizer. It's $18 of heat. 
and it's $26 US dollars of electricity in every ton. Now, currently, when we talk about a circular economy, when we talk about a transition, we don't have a system to recover that. We don't have a way, because our economy isn't designed as such, to recover all that value and get that back onto the farms where we can create really good agricultural land and be less dependent on fertilizers, which come ultimately from, pest, from um, oil-based products. And one example of that would be Renault. Renault has a big remanufacturing program. They have a plant which solely remanufactures just outside of Paris. And when we talk about driving that value from the outer loops to the inner loops, this plant takes engines, gearboxes, and fuel pumps from right across the Renault network. They're collected together. They're actually all broken when they arrive, and they disassemble them. They ultrasonically clean them. They reassemble them into engines, gearboxes, and fuel pumps with some new parts. And they go back out of the door of that factory with the same warranty as a brand new engine, yet at a significantly lower cost than a new engine. And also with the same warranty, you're getting a better product as you as, a, as an individual because obviously you're paying less. They also make more profit from those engines. And we had Carlos Tavares, the COO of Renault, speaking at our Circular Economy Summit in London last year. And he said that that Renault factory, the remanufacturing factory, was their most profitably, profitable factory in the world which shows that that's with current broken engines. What if you take innovation? What if you take creativity? What if from the outset you design every part of that car or the car itself to be remanufacturable, disassemblable? And even when technology surpasses a combustion engine, as in the future we know it will, you have designed that vehicle for disassembly. You know you can recover those materials and you can put them back into the next part of the economy as it flourishes. So just to finish, to come on to the foundation and the work we've been looking at in this space over the last three and a half years since we launched in September 2010, we work in three areas. We work in the area of business innovation, so we work with businesses from all over the world with a huge network where these businesses are all looking to capture value from the circular economy. They're big corporates, they're small innovation companies, and interestingly, also regions have now come into the C100 because regions are fascinated on unlocking the value of a circular economy on a regional basis, looking at those flows of materials and where the value can be found. We also work on education. We work on a, a big program which works with some of the best universities in the world called the schmidt MacArthur Fellowship Program. We bring together students and academics for a fellowship program where they study for one year circular economy activity. And the goal of that is to create pioneer universities and I heard the, the subject of research has been quite topical today. We encourage universities to think through a circular lens, through the students, through the academics, so they can become real research universities around the circular economy. And the third area, analysis, spreads those two. And analysis really is looking at the numbers, looking at the economic driver for a circular economy. What's it worth to the EU economy? What's it worth to the global economy? How does it all fit together to redesign the system of our global economy? And that's work that we've been working on over the last three years. And we feel that there's huge thirst for innovation. There's huge thirst for creativity. When we work with businesses, when we work with universities, these students, they're just they just need a different framework. They need a different way of thinking. They see the opportunities and they want to seize them. And this year we're going to be creating a, an innovation festival which is going to be online. And the idea of this is that we can have thousands of people in a scalable manner le learning about this different way of thinking, learning about the opportunities, showcasing various different things that are going off, and that's going to be this year. So we've created that really in, in response to this huge demand for, from young people, from businesses, to understand different ways of thinking and to look at solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ellen. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, Ellen MacArthur there.